afternoon. My name is Ali Kujuri. I'm an adjunct professor at the Department of Engineering Science and one of the organizers of this uh, lecture series. On, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sharam Marivani and uh, Ms. Kate Lab for uh, helping me in organizing this, uh, uh, this uh, series. Um, on behalf of the Engineering Science Department and the School of Science and Technology, I welcome you all to this eighth lecture uh, for this academic year. And uh, it's, in fact, the uh, 155th lecture uh, uh, since we started in 2006. Uh, before I uh, introduce our guest speaker for today, let me mention that uh, uh, Ms. Kate uh, has uh, ordered pizza, which is going to arrive at uh, uh, 5.30. But uh, we need to uh, basically leave the room uh, at, uh, in fact, uh, maybe 5.50 or so, because, uh, in fact, Dr. Uh, Solemn has a class starting at 6 o'clock, and we need to clean up. Uh, so that's, that's that. And then also, the next lecture uh, will be on the on 5th of March, uh, titled uh, Power Electronics and Its Strength uh, by uh, Mr. Mark uh, Thorin. He's a uh, system design engineer in analog devices in uh, Santa Clara. Our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Roland Betts, and the title of his talk is Aerospace uh, slash uh, uh, Defense, measurement, and application. Uh, Dr. Lauren Betts received his Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Engineering from the University of Alberta, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada in 1997, and his Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University, Stanford, uh, I mean California. Paralto, California in 2003. In 2010, he completed his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Leeds, Leeds uh, United Kingdom. His PhD research focused on the nonlinear vector network analyzer based on the key site PNAX. Lauren started working at Hewlett Packard in 1997, and then uh, in uh, um, joint Agilent Technology, which, which, was, which was in fact a um, divestiture from uh, Hewlett Packard in 1999, and then later uh, he joined Keysight Technologies in 2005. So here is Dr. Spitz. Thank you. Um, so I started HP and it, we became adjunct, we became Keysight, and some of the people in here have worked at the company I've worked at. And it's really, since I've started working there, this same company, we've been doing test and measurements for so long. And it's really been very profitable for, for us. And so we start growing and going into these side areas and, that, and then that spins off and we have to get a new name. That's what happened with computers and printers, um, and then that happened with uh, Agile and a Keysight. So maybe in five or ten years, Keysight will have another name. <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out. Um, so I wanted to give you um, a sense of some of the things that, uh, that we're seeing um, in the aerospace defense um, area at Keysight in some of the commercial applications and, and defense applications that um, we deal with and some of the customers that we work with. Um, this will range from anywhere from military aircraft to new space in, in terms of providing uh, communication around the world for internet access with some of the newer satellites and some of the trends that we're seeing around that. Um, I don't profess to be an expert in everything that's in this talk, so if there is questions that I can't answer, I will get back to you, but please ask all the questions that um, you can think of during the talk. Just interrupt me. If I don't see you, raise your hand and knock on the table or something, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, answer the question. So, um, so HP started, you know, way back in quite a ways ago, 1939 to 2023, um, 2023, um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure why it says 2023. That's a, that must be a typo of some type. But basically, this is saying that uh, Keysight Technologies has a long history of measurement applications, way back when Hewlett and Packard first started the company. And we're still doing the same thing. We're just doing it for new advanced communications and measurement science applications. So in terms of uh, aerospace defense, um, there's a big push to do uh, aerospace and defense modernization, whether that's uh, putting up new types of satellites for internet access, um, high-speed internet, um, different types of radars for military and so on, cost reduction, et cetera. And there's a big push to do that. Some of the areas that um, we're seeing this modernization is in electronic warfare and radar, where, and we're going to talk about that. And basically, we're looking at you know, how do we characterize um, radars and aircraft, whether it's a commercial aircraft or it's a military aircraft. Um, also, the radar uh, stations that are on the ground, anything that's generating a signal that's radar or receiving a signal that's radar. There's a lot of work being done there to, um, to uh, modernize. Uh, signal monitoring. So, for example, at the Olympics, um, you probably don't see it, but there's signal monitoring devices that are placed around these big events to look for signals that may be interfering with communications. So, for example, at, say, NASCAR or some of these other big events where they've got these cars and there's a lot of electronics in them that's sending real time data back to the crew. They don't want that interrupted with any signal by maybe a boat that's passing by in a harbor that's got a radar signal or a spurious signal of some kind or a car or something that drives by and they want to make sure that they try to track what's happening before the event but also during the event. And that's what we call signal monitoring. Um, supply chain is how you build everything, anything from on wafer all the way up to the full radar or electronic piece of equipment that we have in aerospace defense and then operations is fielding it. So once you get it out into the public, how do you maintain it and um, take care of it? So we have a lot of solutions across this whole area. Um, I don't want to make this a marketing pitch. I want to actually get to the meat of the presentation, but it's just some, for each one of those entities, we've got different, um, different solutions. Um, so we've got threat simulation software, satellite monitoring, satellite link monitoring, avionics um, for field operations to make sure things are working. We've got handhelds so you can crawl up on top of a tower and take a handheld with you instead of a huge instrument and monitor what's going on. And I'm happy to talk about that in more detail. Um, we also have a high frequency technology center which um, Don used to work in and so he's very familiar with this. Uh, we do a lot of research around new IC processes, integrated circuits, everything's getting smaller, more integrated, and that goes into our instruments and makes a better measurement for, for the industry. So what I want to talk about today is um, general trends in the aerospace defense industry, um, industry 4.0, software-defined solutions, high-speed recording of playback of wideband signals, multi-channel systems and antenna arrays and the future for space. So depending on the time, I do want to get the future for space, so if time starts to run short, then um, I might skip through some of this. What time should I be stopping for? 5.30. 5.30. Okay. Questions. Okay. All right, so trends. So there's a lot of different forces happening in the defense industry. Um, there's information warfare that's going on. Um, there's new um, types of radars that are being, that are being uh, designed and the whole idea with the defense industry in terms of radar is that you want to um, see but you don't want to be seen. That's the trick. And so there's a lot of ways to do that. You can do stealth technology where you get uh, different angles on the aircraft so the radar signals bounce off so nothing's reflected back to the uh, person that's trying to see you. Um, you can add different coatings on the aircraft to try to absorb some of the radar energy. Um, some of the newer research is around taking that radar signal that's, that's emanating on your aircraft, record it in real time, massage it, play it back out, and make it look like you're somewhere else by modifying its characteristics. And that's where a lot of the modernization is, is happening. Um, so uh, 
you know, there's land, sea, air, and space that uh, all this is happening around. Um, the entire electromagnetic spectrum is contested because there's only so much space there. Um, as you get higher in frequency, of course, you have more attenuation, so it becomes more difficult to deal with um, radars as you get up higher in frequency um, for long distance viewing. And there's a lot of political drivers, drivers in form of expert controls and economic sanctions um, that are continuously changing depending on the environment that's going on. So the market drivers and technology waves um, for radar, space and satellite, avionics, navigation, military, and signal monitoring, this is kind of what we're seeing. So in terms of radar and EW, um, before 2019, a lot of research has been done in uh, GAN amplifiers because they have good characteristics for certain things. They can put out a lot of power. Um, what we're seeing in the future is now digital TR modules. So these are the modules that go into radars. They're transmit and receive modules. Um, in the past and currently, they, they uh, put a, take an RF signal in, they adjust the amplitude and phase, and then spit the RF signal out. Um, these are all put together on a big array, a phase array that's electronically steered. That's why you change the amplitude and phase around. Um, the big push in the industry now is instead of taking RF in and RF out, we're actually putting digital in and getting RF out. And that allows us to get more tightly integrated and do special things with um, the signal itself. Um, space and satellites, uh, frequency range, KA band, the Q band, um, phase array cost for space and satellite for 256 elements, less than 5,000 is kind of what they're looking for. Greater than a uh, 256 elements, uh, less than 1,000 there. Basically, the, the cost is being driven down. Um, avionics and navigation. Um, ADSB is now required for avionics. This is a special type of uh, communication protocol for all, all aircraft now. And military is looking at LTE, so they're more than that. They're actually looking at 5G now. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the defense area for what we would call the commercial comms 5G environment. And then signal monitoring, which I already talked about, is actually capturing the signal, looking for different things, and then reacting to them. So these are some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, the current technology trends is um, we're, they're looking for test equipment to help coordinate and link coverage of complete workflow from simulation to field support. So what that means is when you are designing the system in R&D using the simulation, you then have to take that and build a piece of hardware eventually because that's what people want. And that has to go into system. We call that workflow from design all the way to getting the product out and being supported. That workflow piece um, is very important to have consistency between each one of the uh, segments that you're doing. So for example, when you're doing the simulation and you're trying to simulate a piece of hardware um, to make sure it's going to do what you want it to do, you want to make sure when you build the hardware it actually matches the simulation as closely as you can. And the way you do that is by getting better models in the simulator to be able to simulate the actual hardware. So a lot of research is being done there. Um, system and components require multiple co coherent RF channels for signal generation and analysis. In terms of a radar where you've got multiple planes in the air that are generating radar signals, um, the industry wants to be able to simulate that on the ground, on the, the plane that's actually being hit with those radar signals, so they don't have to fly it. So what they want to do is take a bunch of signal sources, have them frequency and phase and amplitude coherent, combine them together, plug them into the radar uh, receiver on the aircraft, and using software, simulate as if that aircraft is actually flying through that radar environment. So it's much cheaper to do. You don't have to deal with a pilot. You don't have to deal with fuel, um, flight restrictions, anything like that. And you can actually simulate radars that you may not even have. Maybe there's a radar in a foreign country that you want to simulate. Well, you can't do that because you can't just go buy it. You know, maybe you have some way to generate that signal through the sources and, and do it that way. So that's where the coherency comes in and the multiple sources, everything connected together. Um, higher bandwidth 
So move acquired or stored full bandwidth RF signal data from one instrument to another in real time. So not over GPIB, not over LAN per se, but some other high speed network device, um, high speed interconnect. Um, that's really important as the data rates really go up uh, higher and higher. Uh, real time data reduction analysis within an instrument with the ability to support gapless data stream to other devices. Again, it kind of speaks to getting the data from one area to another really, really quickly and maybe do some massaging of the data in real time so you can play it back out um, if you need to. Um, as things have gotten more complicated, we still want to use look at ease of use. Um, we want these things to be easy to use as much as possible um, and we want to uh, uh, get to the first measurement quickly and have faster stimulus response measurement time. Um, and then general purpose frequency conversion capability covering a, a, a range through W bands. So quite a range of frequencies, but also wide bandwidth. So this is, I find, actually pretty interesting. Um, what's the difference between aerospace and defense requirements compared to commercial? So the blue is aerospace defense, the red is 5G, and green is Internet of Things. So RF bandwidth is the total instantaneous bandwidth. It's not, um, you know, the frequency range of, say, one coherent uh, sinusoid where you say it can go from I don't know, 1 gig to 5 gig. It's I want to generate a signal that occupies simultaneously 5 gigahertz of bandwidth. That's where the aerospace defense world is heading towards. That's what the blue line shows right there. 5G is actually heading towards that, and the reason we want the wider bandwidth is why for 5G? Why do you think we need wider bandwidth? Any idea? More data. We want our, <laughs> we want our phones to give us that web page immediately, and we want to do that with, you know, 100 people in the room. So <laughs> that's why we want more bandwidth on, um, for, for 5G. For aerospace defense, we want wider bandwidth for another reason, which we'll show in a second. And Internet of Thing is typically um, very low bandwidth. Uh, latency is how long the signal takes to get from one area to the other. Um, if you're playing a video game and, and you're playing online, you don't want a lot of latency because then everything's delayed. So for 5G, you know, where people might be playing games, you know, 100 microsecond range is kind of the area where the latency might be. When you get into aerospace defense, because we want to do things very quickly and react very quickly, we want the latency to be very, very small. So not a lot of delay at all. Um, and, you know, it could be somewhere around one microsecond for some applications to even less. Um, the selling price for these solutions in, in generating these signals and receiving these signals um, is pretty big difference. So, you know, selling price for aerospace defense could be 200K to 500K or more, much more. And then for 5G, it's, you know, generally less than 100,000 just because of um, the environment of where these are being sell. 5G is generally commercial and um, there's a certain money value target they want to hit. For aerospace defense, there's a lot of funding that's done there. There's a lot of advanced research, so there's a lot more money available typically to, uh, to spend. Coherency is, you know, how you lock different receivers and sources together so they can measure at or stimulate at the same time. And like I had mentioned for aerospace defense where they want to uh, simulate radars or multiple signals for space, we want a very high level of coherency. It's very, very important. 5G is less important and IoT is even less. Uh, port density, how many ports do you need? Um, of course, for aerospace defense, we typically would need a lot of ports, depending on the amount of radars or what we're trying to measure. Um, and uh, for 5G, it's a similar thing because of MIMO, where you've got um, basically a phased kind of array steering thing to be able to steer the signal to all the different phones. And that requires a number of ports to do that. Um, dynamic range. High for aerospace defense, medium for 5G, and uh, less for IoT. So industry 4.0 is really about um, 
unlocking some of the mechanisms for us to do better manufacturing um, and use some of the uh, automation processes of robotics, but also um, uh, machine learning uh, and other types of uh, computerization. So way back in the day, the first uh, industry 1.0, they call it, there was mechanization, water power, steam, you know, generate power and so on. And then 2.0 was mass production, assembly line, uh, you know, Ford was a big uh, promoter of that. Third generation was computer and automation where you've got some now robot maybe welding the car and so on or moving parts here and there. Fourth is really being smart about it. It's taking the robotics and actually um, when you're measuring something or you're building something, the robotics find that something is out of place or the measurement is quite is off and it can on the fly without any operator input do an analysis and figure out what to do. That's where they're really heading with this Industry 4.0. Um, we at Keysight actually have a fully automated um, robotic production line for testing of a lot of our instruments in Santa Rosa and also in our other manufacturing facilities. Um, I won't say that we're at Industry 4.0, but we're definitely at 3.0 in terms of, um, in terms of uh, moving the instrument and making measurements, but not quite on making decisions on how to repair it automatically or, or do a deep dive analysis based on um, machine learning or something like that. So the principles for Industry 4.0 is interconnection. So ability of machines and devices and sensors and people to connect and communicate with, this, with each other via Internet of Things. Uh, information transparency uh, provides a lot of data to the, uh, to the users, the operators, for them to make you know, informed decisions. Um, interconnect to, interconnect, uh, interconnectivity allows operators to collect immense amounts of data all points in the manufacturing process, and that be, can be good or bad because you can get data overload where you get too much data and you don't know what to do with it. Um, so they're trying to address that with some machine learning. Uh, technical assistance, the ability of the assistance system to support humans by aggregating and visualizing information comprehensively. So taking all that data and presenting something that's useful and that you can react on is very important. Uh, and decentralized decisions, ability of the cyber physical systems to make decisions on their own, like I talked about prior. So in aerospace defense, it's usually what we call high mix, low volume. What that means is um, everything that goes through the production process, every one of them, I'm saying every one in quotes, is different. It's not like when um, the phone is going through a production line where every phone is the same and there's a huge volume of these. It's a lot different. Um, not everybody wants a network analyzer or not everybody wants a radar. So, um, and every radar might be different or every network analyzer might have a different option applied to it when it's going through this production process. So their aerospace defense is high mix, low volume. Uh, the test times are pretty long. I'll, I'll give you an example. For a satellite, for them to uh, make sure it's going to work in space, they have to put it in a thermal vac chamber, which means they've got to get it into the space environment while on the ground. So they've got to uh, put a vacuum in this chamber where the satellite is going to be and then get it to a temperature that is like space. How long do you think it actually takes to get that chamber to the space environment? How long do you think? Just a rough guess. Is it minutes, hours, days, or weeks? Well, I'm using depending on the size of the thermal back, but I've seen like up to a day. Yes. So it could be multiple days for this to actually get up to, to the right temperature and <laughs> down to the right temperature and to the environment that is in space. So that takes a long time. Once it gets there, you don't want to actually, you can't go in the chamber. I mean, if you're running a measurement and the satellite's in there, you've got to make sure that the measurement's being done right. You, you, if you have a problem, that's a huge deal because if the cable is bad and you go in there and you have to go in there, then you're down for days and that's a lot of money. That's a big deal. So a lot of efforts being placed into making sure that the measurements are done accurately and there's 
um, you know, the right error correction applied and the uncertainties are good and you have high quality cables, um, calibration pods inside the thermal vac chamber to make sure that you can recal without having to go into the, into the chamber and so on. So some of the examples of, of what's being tested here are small constellation uh, satellites, so small satellite constellations, uh, missiles and subsystems, so all the electronics and missiles um, can be tested um, uh, in, or will actually are this high mix, low volume, radar and EW and low cost uh, UAs, UAVs. Um, so this actually changed the manufacturing process that was used traditionally because the measurements take so long um, to actually uh, characterize these devices. So um, if the measurements were fast, they wouldn't do this, but uh, the industry's moved away from highly integrated big test systems to a distributed approach. So you might have a measurement on one part of the automation where it's measuring S parameters and it does that pretty quick. Then you have another one that's actually measuring um, uh, maybe harmonics, so maybe that takes a little longer. And then you've got another station that actually is measuring uh, noise floor. Maybe that one takes forever. Well, you don't want to have all those measurements in one monolithic test uh, environment because um, they, they just ties up the S parameter measurements and the harmonic measurements because the noise figure takes so long or noise floor take, measurements take so long. So you try to split it up so that you can actually get these, pr these products through the manufacturing processes in, in a distributed way. So you get higher test equipment utilization when you do that. And um, the other thing it really helps with is, let's say you got through the S parameter measurements, you got through the harmonic measurements, all that was fine. You got to the noise figure measurements. Um, and and let me step back, that was all one monolithic, so it was all done on one monolithic thing, not distributed, and all of a sudden the noise figure measurement failed, or, or something happened, and the data was bad. Well, now you've got to go back and remeasure everything, potentially recal everything on that whole station, whereas if you had it distributed, you could actually just rerun the noise figure measurement only, maybe recal that, not have to deal with the harmonic measurement cal or the S parameter measurement cal, because you knew those were okay, because the measurements were fine. All right. So um, what we call new space, um, some people may have heard of OneWeb and, and some of these other uh, programs that are going on. Um, it's kind of changing things a little bit because the old satellites were huge. They were big, they still are big, and they're expensive, very expensive. Uh, and so there's some push to put internet into space so we can get internet everywhere around the globe. And it will not support this, the cost structure will not support these mammoth, huge satellites distributed all over the globe. So they're going to more smaller satellites with, um, that, that are closer to the Earth because you don't want as much latency and they're distributed around the actual Earth in, you know, with more quantity to cover things. And there's redundancy, so if one satellite fails, it's fine, because you put enough up there that you've got, still got coverage. Um, but that changes the manufacturing process and the cost around it, because um, you want to test these things, these smaller satellites, uh, fast, and you want to basically reduce the cost of test, of testing these things, because you're, you've got a lot of them to go through, and some of them would be throwaway in that if they go bad up there, you've got redundancy. So we can't spend all this money um, in investing in, in the testing like we did before. So, um, so this new space actually, uh, the business models changed some things and the key considerations to look at is you want to design for manufacturability, volume, test, and cost. So when you're looking at the overall business model, you want to make sure you look for that so that your cost infrastructure for test is within the range that you expect or that you need to be profitable. Um, there has to be a clear criteria for production ready. You know, is it ready for production? Have you done all the design properly? And you're not going to have all these failures in production that you then have to rework. You'd rather have the device, a satellite, go through once and be done, and then you sell it. Uh, minimize use of handcrafted products. We want to take stuff that's off the shelf, basically. And whatever process automation we can use is, is typically uh, very, very beneficial um, in this environment. 
All right, so pause there for a sec, see if there's any questions on what I've covered so far before I go to software defined solutions. Yeah. Question I have is, is uh, in defense electronics, are they making from the DOD side a greater effort now than they used to about reducing tests and things like that? I would say that there's a group of people, it's like for, for satellite, that have been doing satellites since the 70s and 80s, yeah. and they're resistant to change. Yeah. Because they've, they've gone through everything. I see a smile back there. They've gone through the, all the problems, right. and they know what works, and they do not want to change anything at all. Okay. Um, but this new space thing where the internet now wants to go up there and have these smaller satellites, yeah. and you've got, now you've got this whole other area of, of uh, engineers that are saying, no, we're, not, we're gonna do things differently our way, and um, we're gonna reduce the cost of tests, because we have to, yeah. to be profitable and get these things right. up. So that's kind of, I mean, there's people still making measurements on satellites that um, you know, were developed 20, 30 years ago, and they just don't want to change it because it works for them. Yeah. You know? So. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You know a couple of them. What's that? We know a couple of them. Do you? Okay. They're out here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions on that topic? Okay. Um, software defined solutions. So, um, how many people here have developed software before? Okay. How many people have developed FPGA code? One, two, maybe. Okay. So software, there was a lot more people that developed software here. Um, less people with FPGA. And do you know why, maybe, why there's less people that have developed FPGA in the room? Let's just say that the demographic was such that you could do either. Um, part of the reason there's a lot more tools and there's a lot more um, infrastructure in place to do just plain software development compared to FPGA development work. Um, what I mean, difference between software and FPGA work, is FPGA work is really tied more to the hardware and less on the operating system, whereas software is defined more on the operating system side. The other reason is there just hasn't been enough tools or enough open architecture to do FPGA work. Um, we've got FPGAs in every instrument we probably have at Keysight, but customers, generally speaking, have not had access to that because of IP reasons or or it just hasn't been available. Well, that's changing, actually, a lot. So if you look at a, um, a device here, we've got RF coming in, we've got RF coming out. Um, we've got a mixer that down converts the signal, digitizes it, and, and puts it into FPGA. A bunch of stuff is done there, whatever you want to do. Maybe you want to change the amplitude and phase or something like that. And then that gets pushed, pushed to, a, to a DAC to spit it out, and then we upconvert it and play it out again. Um, it would sure be nice if customers or other people or students could actually get right into these components and add their own FPGA code. That would open up things a lot for real-time uh, types of analysis and, and, um, and programming. Uh, up to this date, we haven't really offered that, and, and I, other, I mean, it, it's just becoming more, more of a, a thing that other companies and ourselves are looking at. Um, so traditional instruments are, you know, like a big network analyzer, like you have over in the lab there. Um, all the real-time processing is closed. You can't actually get in there and modify the FPGA. Um, all the non-real-time processing is closed. So all of this, you can't even go in there and add an application per se because it's not open. So there's now more of a push to go to distributed um, type of instruments where you've got, say, PXI cards, that's a, that is a VNA or some other type of instrument. And then you've got another piece of open software that actually talks to it. And so you can actually modify that open software and, and do what you want with it. But the real-time processing in the hardware is still closed. You can't really do much with it. Well, the next gen is actually everything's open. I mean, there's still areas you can't get into in the FPGA, but generally speaking, you could program the FPGA, you can program the, the software that controls it, and that opens up a lot of different things. Um, so, so, for example, uh, digital pre-distortion for 4 and 5G, which is a 
requires real time that opens up um, an avenue for that. Radar target emulation, where you want to emulate a target or you want to take a signal in, massage it, play it out so that you look like you're somewhere else when really you're here. Um, quantum computing is another one, and MIMO. So you know, there's a big push to do this, and we're working on that. Um, we have some instrumentation and cards already that let you do this, and we have an infrastructure that we're putting into place called Pathway of FPGA. This isn't a marketing pitch, it's just general information that allows users to actually put their own FPGA code in the instrument themselves um, in a somewhat simplified uh, way. So um, again, like I said, you get real-time control and modification of the instrument functions. You can add or import library components, do your own math and DSP, and just basically whatever you would like to do in real time. So this will help accelerate um, hardware in the loop testing because um, uh, you know, one of the bottlenecks is actually getting data from one area to the other on, say, a, a PXI instrument, um, where you've got one card here that's got some data and you <coughs> want to spit it over to the other card over the back plane. Maybe you want to send data at 10 or 20 gigabits per second or even higher, and you, you can run into problems with that. So um, you can take this big thing sometimes and actually refactor it into a smaller thing not all the time, but sometimes everything's tightly integrated and now you can actually get much higher speeds because everything's so close together and now you've got a way to actually program the FPGA and the software um, to, actually, uh, to actually make the measurements or whatever you're trying to accomplish here. So here's an example of a digital down converter um, in FPGA where you, um, let's say you capture 10, gigahertz, 10, gigabits, uh, 10 gigahertz wide bandwidth, but you only want to analyze, uh, say, I don't know, 100 megahertz um, in different chunks of 100 megahertz, maybe just 100 megahertz. Well, let's say the instrument grabs all 10 gigahertz at once of bandwidth. Well, you can use what's called a digital down converter, so not a normal local oscillator. Everything's happening in the mathematical domain, in the FPGA, and you can down convert that and do decimation and other things using the different toolkits that are provided and add your own filtering um, and do that programmatically instead of actually using hardware. So that's one of the uh, things that uh, the industry is really excited about because they want to be able to do, um, do these things for, uh, for what they're trying to use to, to analyze um, different types of signals. And the same thing for digital up conversion. Again, you've got to take the signal that you want to put out. Say you've got um, a 100 megahertz signal that you want to play out at, um, I don't know, 10 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. Um, you'd use a digital up converter where you take the data that you got and then you mathematically mix it up to the uh, 5 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz uh, bandwidth that, or frequency that you want. And that 100 megahertz chunk actually gets mathematically shifted up there and played out. Now, all that requires a high-speed digitizer and, and high-speed um, um, arbitrary waveform generator. Um, you've got to have the bandwidth to be able to do that, but the industry's really heading that way for a lot of things. Now, up higher frequency, you know, 100 gigahertz, there's still no 100 gigahertz digitizer or arbitrary waveform generator yet, so you still have to mix up and down. But 20, 30 gigahertz, we now have digitizers that cover that instantaneous bandwidth, so we can do that. All right. Uh, some of the application areas for software-defined instruments, signal monitoring, signal intelligence, surveillance, there's just a bunch. You can just read them there um, where this uh, SDR, uh, SDI, if you want to call it, um, is, is going to be very beneficial in. Okay. All right. I'm going to pause there, see if there's any questions on that section. So, I have a question. Yeah. So, um, so obviously there's got to be some kind of hardware there, right? Yeah, so... Mm -hmm. The hardware and then... Yeah, 
So that you talk about the digital up converter and digital down converter example. Yeah, so if you, as an example, if you wanted a digital down converter, um, you'd have a uh, high speed digitizer that that's the hardware. So you're going to take, let's say its sample rate is high enough so you can instantaneously, instantaneously down uh, capture 10 gigahertz worth of, of bandwidth. But let's say that now that you have that data, you, you, you don't want to analyze all of that data. It's just it's an enormous amount of data if you look at it, the sample rates that are coming out, the speed of the data. So you'd use a digital down converter in software based on that hardware that's captured that signal to only look at, a say, a 100 megahertz chunk at 2 gigahertz. That's what you'd use the software to do. But the hardware would be the actual digitizer. Any other questions? Okay. So high-speed recording and playback of signals, I kind of mentioned that already, but here's some examples. So um, we've got, say, uh, two airplanes in the air that have radars on them, and they're scanning around. Let's say there's three. One, two, three. They're sc the radar is scanning around looking for things, and there's different scan motions, um, of these radars looking around. Basically, you're looking around visually, except electronically, at what's around. Um, this is a, a type of persistent display where it's actually called a real-time display, too, where um, a signal on the spectrum analyzer display like this actually stays on the screen for a little while, so you have some time history when signals and events occur. So if something blips up real fast, it stays there, and if it goes, you know, changes, you can actually see what's going on. So if you look closely at this one here, you see that there's a, you know, a little peak here, and then you see these lines. Well, as this radar is scanning around, because it's doing a circular scan, um, the spectrum analyzer or, digi or a digitizer is actually seeing that signal go up and down, up and down at that frequency. And that's what you're seeing here on the display with the software. It's capturing not only instantaneous frequency, but also what's happening over time. So you can actually see what's going on. And same thing with this. This is also during a circular scan. Over here, you're seeing what's called an interceptor radar. And then there's something trying to jam it. Jamming means that you're putting out a radar signal. Um, let's, say you're, let's say you're receiving a radar signal, and, and you don't want whoever's pinging you to know that you're there, you want to scramble what they're seeing. So what you end up doing is spitting out a signal at the same frequency that, that uh, looks like a reflection off of the aircraft, but it confuses the other radar that sent it, so it doesn't know what it is. It thinks it's garbage, and that's what you're seeing here. There's actually two radars here. There's the one trying to detect the, the object, and the other is the object trying to tell it that um, there's nothing there. <laughs> there's just some signal that masks it. It's almost like you had two people in a room, somebody was talking, and then somebody starts talking over them, and that they talk loud enough that you can't understand anything. That's kind of what's going on. That's what a jammer does. Um, so to, to get all that high-speed data that we're capturing in these events, we, from one piece of hardware to analyze it to another, where you do have these distributed cards, um, that data is coming across very, very fast. Um, we've got systems that have terabytes of storage data that fill up in a matter of, of seconds, <laughs> I mean, or you know, minutes. And it's just so to get that data across, we need some type of high-speed interface to allow us to do that if we need to, if we can't get things close enough together. Um, and one of the standards that is becoming prevalent in the industry is called ODI. It's the Optical Data Interface. Um, it allows you to do 20 gigabytes per second of continuous streaming speed with a single optical cable. So it's very, very, very fast. Um, speed increases with multiple cables. You can do a parallel system. Um, there's a bunch of data formats that it supports. If anyone's familiar with Vita 49, um, which is an SDR packet structure, and it works with different instruments. Um, so this is something that's becoming more and more important in these real-time systems for, for aerospace defense. 
The ODI ports can be connected to any type of instrument. You just have to make sure that um, you integrate it when you're designing it. Um, so we've got ODI ports on sources and receivers and digitizers and so on. Um, they can be placed anywhere in PXI, LXI, or USB instrument. It's an industry standard. It's not a key site standard. Um, and it's plug and play. Um, has anyone heard of ODI before? See one not at least. Okay. So here's an example of some of the real-time data that would be coming across potentially. IQ samples, so that's the bandwidth that's been digitized, the real and imaginary data that's coming across um, full speed. Um, there's blocks of IQ samples with summary data, blocks of IQ samples which will be transmitted following a hardware trigger signal. So there's a bunch of different um, types of data formats that we need to support over the streaming interfaces. Um, it's all about getting the data where you need it to go as quickly as possible without destroying it. That's the whole point of uh, uh, transferring uh, the data. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah the, when they, uh, let's say the plane is just uh, setting the, uh, uh, the, uh, the radar and, and then receives the, thing, the data, now is it going to be stored there and also transmitted down or what? Is your question, if I'm in an airplane and somebody's, and I receive their radar signal, right. are you asking is it stored somewhere or is it, is played it, back? Is it both stored or just uh, and also transmitted or just transmitted? Um, both, depending right. on the radar receiver. Right. The radar, some radar receivers are actually storing the data so they right. can analyze it later. Right. Because yeah. it might be a new radar that they've never seen before. Now, does it do any reconstruction of the data at all? I mean, for, when, when it's for, for example, the imaging the down, I mean, the earth or whatever? Not for the radar, not for imaging, no. This right. would be more of, um, say, an old radar that has a power supply. Right. The radar pulses this RF signal. Right. So it pulses like this. You know, this. And then there's a carrier inside. Right, yes. Yeah. Now, um, a lot of the newer aircraft will actually be able to look at the characteristics of the radar signal that's they're being received. Uh, you've seen Top Gun, you know, where it's like shows, and they'll actually put on the display what that radar is. They'll say, "Oh, it's a uh, it's a Canadian uh, military airplane or something," because they, what they look at, they can't do it all the time, but. An older radar, say a ground-based radar that's pinging up towards the uh, aircraft, it's got a power supply. That power supply has to power all the amplifiers to amplify this pulse signal that it's sending out to ping to, to actually hit the aircraft to identify it. That's a lot of power. Sometimes what happens is on the envelope of that carrier, you might have some, some overshoot and some ringing because the power supply can't, is not, doesn't have enough bandwidth or it's just not constructed enough. And so this actually becomes an, uh, an identifier, the carriers in here, where you can say, oh, I see this signal has this wobbliness to it. I know that's from that Canadian ground-based radar. And you put that up on the display and it says Canada radar block. That's as an example. So, this is the kind of analysis that we would be doing on the signal, not ground-based mapping or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Now, the data which is transmitted down, I bet it's going to be encrypted, right? They, they try to spoof the signal. Yeah. They try to make sure, they, they don't want you, they don't want the, the person that's, that's sending the signal to identify the aircraft doesn't want that aircraft to be able to modify it, play it back, or do funny things with it to because it. So the, the the radar that's putting out the signal puts some coding sometimes right. on it, right. so it knows what what's returned off the reflection is mine, not somebody else's. Okay. Yeah. Any you. question? You're welcome. Any other questions on that? Okay. All right. Let's see how I'm doing here. A multi-channel system and, a, and antenna arrays, these are all around um, uh, these uh, s beam steering and so on. So a phased array, how many people have heard of phased array antennas? 
quite a few people. Uh, what do they do? Stir what was the beam electronically. They stir the beam electronically. So instead of having this radar that you have a mechanical thing that moves it around to, you know, find or point at the target, now it's either doesn't move or maybe it moves a tiny bit. And electronically, we steer the beam up and down by using uh, a bunch of transmit receive modules. That's kind of what's shown actually on the prior slide a little bit. Well, you can't really see it, but on that, that, that yellow piece there could be thousands. Actually, it says right there, 3,000 plus active elements, the active elements being TR modules, where each one of those elements you can modify the amplitude and phase, and combining and shifting the amplitude and phase independently of all those allows you to uh, steer the beam electronically. So you can point in different directions. Um, and that's really important. This, hap this technology happened a long time ago. So basically, it just makes the uh, aperture look much, much bigger. Yeah, yes, yes. You can think of that like that. Yeah, okay. yeah. In that you can move it around right. electronically without yeah. physically moving it. Um, and, you know, the mechanical movement, you know, for aircraft that are in a SAR where they have to evade things, they're pulling a lot of Gs you know, six, 10 Gs, the mechanical radars, that's a lot of force on them. So if you can have something that doesn't move, that's much, you know, that's really beneficial. So th th they've been around for a while, these um, electronically steered arrays, but what's, what's new is the digital in and RF out now, not RF in, RF out, and they're becoming more and more integrated. And the stuff that's been used in radars is actually being used in commercial comms. So all the 5G stuff is all steering beams around. It's all, instead of it broadly uh, spilling out the signal everywhere, it's shifting like this. It's steering the beam around at each individual and giving you your data when you need it. So a lot of the aerospace defense um, uh, knowledge and, and research is being pushed into commercial. Um, so, so there's a lot of benefits to doing that, which we talked about. The challenges are increased complexity for design and test. Um, there's just so many arrays on these things, and they take, you know, they're very complicated to test. So there's a big push to do that um, and to do it effectively. Uh, so here's an example of a TR module um, or, or just a, a phased array module. Um, and I think we kind of talked a lot about this. Um, they could be broadband modulated signals, not just pulsed, like in MIMO for 5G. So the radar receivers on, a, on an aircraft, they want to know where, they want to know where the signal is coming from. So if you had an aircraft that's sending a radar signal trying to identify you, you yourself want to know where that came from because you can say, oh, I see you over there. I haven't sent any signal to you, but I know you're over there. And they do that using what's called the angle of arrival. And how many dimensions are in space? Three, right? And then we've got time, which is a fourth dimension if you're trying to get time. So what they end up doing is they end up putting uh, antennas with receivers on different points on the airplane that are spatially apart a certain amount. And there's mathematics around all this. The placement of these antennas allow the uh, aircraft receiver and, and uh, pilot to, to determine where that radar signal is coming from. How do you think that occurs? Well, what, what, what does the spacing of these elements, or why, are, why isn't it just one? Why couldn't you just use one to determine where the signal's coming from? Timing or phase? Yeah, exactly, phase. So if you have a signal coming this way, a radar signal, it's going to hit this receiver first and then this receiver next. So there's a phase change between these two receivers and using that information of phase and or amplitude and or time, you can determine where that radar signal is coming from. And this is almost, these are on all the aircraft. Um, what they want to do is they want to be able to simulate this without actually flying the aircraft. They want the aircraft on the ground. They want to take a bunch of signal generators that generate signals and put it in an environment that may have 
10 or 20 different radars hitting it and see what it does. And that's what's shown here. You've got a bunch of signal sources that are coherent in that the phase and amplitude and frequency can be adjusted relative to one another. So you can actually make all the changes of all the signals that are playing out. You're going to put them into four independent ports with four cables only, plug them right into the ports on the antennas while the airplane's on the ground, and the airplane radar uh, receiver has no idea it's flying. It knows there's signals, it just, and it thinks it's flying, but it's, it's like it's in a dream. It's sitting on the ground, it doesn't know it, but it, there's signals playing out, and um, they use this technique to actually uh, program the radars, validate the radars, and through the whole workflow of radar, uh, make sure it's working properly. Um, these show the equations. If, if, you've, if you've ever taken a radar course, uh, the importance of bandwidth and frequency. So cross range, cross range resolution is expressed with this equation here, delta x, and it's a function of the wavelength lambda. So higher frequency means more cross-range resolution, which means you can see things more finer um, and smaller when you, are, um, when you have higher frequency. And um, downrange resolution is how far can you see down, you know, what resolution can you see downrange away from you, and that's a function of the bandwidth. So wider bandwidth means more downrange resolution. So what do you think everybody wants? They want higher frequency and more bandwidth, <laughs> so they can get everything. <laughs> All right, I've got a couple minutes left, let's see. I think I'm near the end, I think I might have made it. All right, the future for space. I talked about this already. Um, how many people have been reading about OneWeb and all the uh, investment that's going on in, um, you know, got these really, uh, pe these people have got a lot of money um, that are investing personally or with their company in space to get internet everywhere. You have. What have you heard or read? Well, there's stuff like they're trying to put a constellation like Starlink in. Yeah. And then there's also another push with uh, for like commercial um, space company like uh, Blue Origins and yeah. uh, Vector and right. Electron rockets. Yep. Yep. So there's a big sp there's a big push to get internet and other communication in space um, besides just um, aerospace defense. Um, so satellite business technology trends and in, in the ecosystem interconnected operations. So space, earth platforms and components. Um, you know, we've got earth station receivers. Everyone's got direct TV. We've got launch, launch platforms and capsules to get those up there. There's operation and maintenance. This is kind of the ecosystem of the satellite industry. Um, we don't play much in Keysight in the um, launch platforms and capsules per se, but um, testing electronics we do. Um, the new business model for new space is commercial off-the-shelf parts. We want to be able to buy these commercial off-the-shelf parts. We call it COTS, commercial off-the-shelf. Um, because it's cheaper. You don't want anything custom made. They want to put planet-wide low latency internet all over the world with these small satellites. Space tourism, asteroid mining, <laughs> non-traditional traditional funding models. So we've got Elon Musk and Branson and others that have got a lot of money and they're willing to just throw it in there because they do see benefit. Information is, is uh, if you have access to information, that's important. And if you get information, if you, and if you, have act, if you can control, I won't say control, but if you are in the pipeline somewhere to get that information from one area to the other, you're probably in a good area. So that's why a lot of people want to invest in this new space because everyone wants access to information. And if you can play in that area, you probably will make some money. Um, there has to be a willingness to trade off risk, cost, and speed. So risk is something to be considered, assessed, and managed. Um, but the level of risk tolerance is a little bit different depending on what you're doing. You know, if you're putting up a satellite, that's one thing, but if you're putting up a person, that's another for space tourism. But the trend is there. There's people actually going up into space now. Uh, space is hard and risky. It's a one-shot deal, hard to fix in orbit. 
So for satellites, that's why the, uh, this uh, push to put the internet up into space, they want to put a lot of satellites up and have redundancy so if one fails, you have redundancy and you don't care about it. And if it's cheap enough, you don't really care about the cost either. So that's the driver is cost. Um, there's, of course, it's a hostile environment. We already talked about that. And more bandwidth. Everyone wants more bandwidth. Higher frequencies, get more data so you can surf the internet faster and so on. So this whole thing is driving down the cost of test. They want to actually test these things very, very cheaply. If they didn't have to test these satellites at all, they would be so happy. If they could just simulate it and build it and be done, they would save so much money. But that is just not the reality right now. But we're heading towards that in small steps. At least we're, we're getting rid of the, the uh, potential issue of doing multiple prototypes and pilots and so on before you get a shippable product. If you can simulate something very well, um, you can get rid of some of those stages and maybe only have a one, pot, one prototype and one pilot and so on. Um, so money's involved here to, to make sure people are making their profits. Um, real quick, if you work in aerospace defense for the students in here or maybe people that are in the industry, you'll hear what's called bent pipe. That is what is traditionally used in the satellite industry when you talk to the engineers that have been designing satellites for a long time. A bent pipe is a satellite that's up in space and you're sending a signal up that's got say uh, XM radio up to it and all you're doing is taking it, bending it back down and playing it out to a wide audience, back down to earth. That's all a bent pipe does. It's got some amplifiers and stuff but if you hear the term bent pipe that's, that's what, it, what it's got in there. Um, where they're kind of heading more is the ability to do this, where you've got a satellite that takes a signal, demodulates it, does a bunch of stuff, and spits it out. Um, and really what you're trying to do here is maybe clean up the signal. You've got some signal coming in from, from the Earth up to the satellite, and it's got distortion on it. Um, if it's digital, maybe you know there's some error correction um, on the signal that's embedded that would be done here, and then you error correct it and play it out. Um, in the correct digital format when you send it back down. Um, there's you know, power and cost. These things take a lot of power to actually uh, generate these signals to send down to Earth. So um, a lot of research is being done to properly characterize the amplifiers that mm -hmm. are in the satellites so that you don't have this, which is spectral regrowth. Really ideally you want this where your bandwidth of your signal is and instead you get this that's due to the nonlinearities of the amplifier. And so there's a bunch of different measurements and advancements in how to characterize that so that you don't have this. Or you're able to compensate it somehow using digital pre-distortion. And I think, make sure I get, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably, probably good enough. So concluding remarks, there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> you can probably tell we could talk about this for weeks. Um, the purpose of this talk is really to show that there's a lot of effort being done to be able to test all of these different areas effectively in terms of accuracy but also cost. Um, and so we're obviously at Keysight involved in that. Um, there's the push to get higher bandwidth higher frequency, higher ports. There's technology being um, taken from aerospace defense, such as beam steering and putting into 5G for MIMO, et cetera. So some things are converging. And then there's a big push to put softer defined um, capability so that you can do programming at the FPGA level to be able to um, do real time uh, analysis or modification of signals. All right, so that's the end of my talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know I'm now four minutes over, but uh, thank you for attending. Yeah, in fact, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to uh, thank you, Dr. Warren Betts, for his very interesting and instructive and uh, also uh, informative uh, talk. And uh, if you want to ask a question, you can do it 